Good afternoon. I am very grateful to ICE for giving me this opportunity. Um, I come from China. From 2015 onward, China has put forward such national information development strategy as um, promote big data development and internet government of fire service, etc. And all regions and uh, sectors have widely conducted the construction of the integrated government of fire service platform online. With the platform, government of fire data can be brought together and uh, enterprises and masses can handle things of different fields uh, to solve the problem of uh, slow and complicated handling of uh, fires caused by the need to run many departments in government of them. In Shanghai, for example, it would take a long day uh, rather than the past one or two months to go through the uh, procedures for the opening a new form once and for all. So today, my topic is um, collaborative design of the electronic records management system under big data uh, circumstances. I will divide uh, my speech into four parts like this. First of all, uh, I'd like to introduce the policy background for China's Internet Government of Fire Services. In March 2016, Internet and Government of Fire Services appeared for the first time uh, in Government Work Report. Later on, the uh, State Council issued uh, issued uh, instructional way on um, celebrating the Internet and Government of Fire Service work, uh, making the Internet Government of Fire Service work uh, being placed on the national strategy uh, agent, uh, agenda. <coughs> In December of the same year, uh, the State Council issued a guide to uh, construction of the Internet and Government of Fire Service uh, technological system. Uh, dividing the Internet and Government of Fire Service te technical system and the service system across the board. In July, uh, 2018, the State Council uh, promulgated instructional views on uh, celebrating the construction of the integrated online government of fire service platform nationwide. Uh, that's a map for the construction of the nationwide integrated online government of fire service platform. And in uh, April 2019, the State Council promulgated the regulations on online government of fire service um, as a degree for further conforming the legal force of online archives, certificates, photos, and uh, 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 signatures. Uh, in the cause of promoting the Internet and Government Affairs Service policy, the crux is the construction of the integrated online service platform. So the uh, second part, uh, I'd like to introduce a, celebrating, a, a, a celebration of the construction of the Internet and Government Affairs Service platform. Uh, the Internet Government of Fire Service Platform is composed 
of the National Governmental Fire Service Platform. The Governmental Fire um, Service Platform of the State Council's Related Department and the Government of Fair Service Platform of various regions. As a central, central hub of nationwide integrated online service platform, the uh, National Government of Fire Service Platform connect with Government of Fire Service Platform of the province and the state council's related departments. Uh, at the end of the 2018, 43 related departments of the state councils and 32 provinces have set up internet and government platform and uh, 30 regions with integrated online government of fire service platform are provisional uh, municipal and county level has been set up. Uh, it is predicated that by the end of 2022, uh, uni unified standards, joint functioning and business uh, collaboration will be exercised as a whole in nationwide government of fire service. And all the service will be brought into the platform to realize the practice of all to be had online. Uh, the uh, uh, archive sector should uh, shoulders the historical mission of the gardening human memories in the digital area. So we should do a good job of the electronic record management. Currently, the most layering is issue in the collaborative design of the electronic record management system and the internet and government affairs service platform. So in the third part, uh, let's fill it together the experience achieved in the collaborative design of the electronic record management system and the internet and government affairs service platform in China. I will take Zhejiang as example. In some uh, regions where information level is high, while inter uh, internet and governmental fire service is developing first, the archive sector has followed up steadily and has explored a path for the collaborative design of the electronic record management system and the internet and government of fire service platform. <coughs> uh, from the successful experience, we can see easily and clearly that um, the collaborative design of the electronic records management system and the internet government of fire service platform is not only the design of the system collaboration, but the um, but is a combination of policy collaboration, business collaboration, and a system collabor a constru a system construction collaboration. <coughs> First of all, uh, the most important is uh, collaborate design of policy. <coughs> In this respect, we have conducted the work mainly as follows. Uh, first, uh, actively enjoy, enjoy in uh, enjoy in the leading group for the internet and government affairs service work. Uh, 
leading group is an organization for uh, our uh, working mechanism unique to China. In China, uh, there are a large number of the, uh, deliberative coordinating bodies that are named the uh, leading group, which are uh, supplement the, con uh, the conventional government uh, governance partners uh, adopted by the party and government system and how the uh, trans-departmental uh, co uh, coordinating power. Uh, at the archive departments of the province where the uh, electronic records management is well done, uh, such departments are uh, Without exception, members unit of the leading group for the internet and government affairs service work of those provinces. Integrating the concept of uh, uh, electronic record management in government policy and document. Uh, for example, in Zhejiang province, since 2016, uh, the Zhejiang province government has issued a lot of documents, uh, all of which have added the requirements for the management of electronic records. Uh, in this way, the electronic records management requirements have, have been added to the front in the design of the Internet and Government Affairs Service platform uh, from the policy perspective. Uh, three, using e-document filing fulfillment ratio to appraise government work plat uh, uh, government work performance. Uh, Appraising uh, work is to better promote work while the work is being conducted in all provinces of China. Appraising work will also be conducted at the end of the year. Establishment of the uh, 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 appraisal indicators is, uh, is of visual importance to establishment of work um, pri priorities of various units. Uh, the archive sector should uh, strive to build the uh, e-document filing work with the uh, uh, appraisal uh, indicators of the Internet and Government of our Service work to propel the, the implementation of the electronic filing work uh, through the above design we are uh, laying a solid foundation for promoting the design uh, uh, the digital filing with uh, digital memory produ uh, produced by the Internet and Government of our Service Platform and, uh, and related uh, uh, and related long term storage. Second, uh, we need to achieve collaborative design of business. We did three things. One, uh, reach of the key issue based on the scientific research projects. Two, uh, uh, synchronous straightening out of items for administrative approval and configuration of um, parameter uh, for filing. Uh, three, uh, 
dismantling of traditional management model and exploration of applicable management patterns. Uh, the first and the third point are easy to understand. Uh, and due to the limited time, uh, I will uh, not carry out them. I want to focus on the second point. Uh, in the past, uh, we are not experienced in the filing of items for uh, administrative approval. Uh, we, were, we, uh, we were not experienced in filing of items for administrative uh, approval. As a result, um, archives department and government of fire service uh, department should uh, uh, straighten out the items for administrative approval to uh, form deleted filing scope and uh, the uh, record uh, uh, retention sh uh, schedules, uh, which is the most important basic work. Uh, for example, uh, Zhejiang province, uh, Zhejiang archives have done a lot of work in clearing up the items. As of the end of the uh, last year, uh, filing scope and record retention schedules had been worked out for uh, 270,000 administrative power items through the province, and the filing parameter configuration had been done for 100,000 items. Making business and uh, technical preparations for the collaborative design of the archives, Mm. Uh, for the archive management system and the internet government of fire service platform. <laughs> uh, the successful uh, completion of the collaboration design of the uh, policy and business make the uh, completion of the collaborative design of the system a success. So uh, the last one uh, is collaborative design of system. This is the map of the uh, collaborative design of the electronic record management system and internet uh, government service platform in Zhejiang province. Uh, filing of uh, elect uh, electronic document and, and management of electronic records that crop up on the internet and the government of fire service platform were related to the uh, business system, uh, the uh, data exchange platform, uh, the long-term storage system and the access system, uh, etc. Uh, so, uh, uh, because the time is limited, so, so I won't talk about it more. Okay, let's get to the conclusion. Uh, <coughs> concept of collaborative design of Propel uh, propelled in an all-round way in the future. Now, archives departments of all provinces in China have made different progress in the internet and government of service work. So, some provinces have made rapid progress and have explored a, a successful path for the collaborative design of the electronic records management system and the internet and government of our service platform. Um, from the nationwide perspective, uh, perspective other archives department will all followed up step by step to the uh, rhythm of government 
uh, our, uh, RNT uh, digital transformation and jointly enter into the era of digital governance. Uh, that's all I, I said. Mm, because my English is uh, not my mother uh, language, so maybe my expression is not perfect enough. But if, if, but if you are interested in my topic, maybe uh, we can communicate with each other by email later. Uh, this is my um, email address. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My presentation uh, represents the beginnings of a research project that pulls from several disciplines, cognitive science, contemplative science, and archival studies, in order to better understand how we can help our users in the reading room constructively deal with distractions and disruptions to their research. This effort began with an interest in how our brains process information differently based on whether we're reading on a screen or reading on paper. And it grew to include a broader consideration of focus and concentration, and going even beyond the reading platforms to consider how distractions play out in our reading room. For this presentation, I'll offer some thoughts and observations about focus and distractions in the reading room that present an impact for our users, and I'll propose how we might approach in a, um, adopt an approach of radical empathy and employ contemplative practices in our reading room designs to enhance our users' contemplation and understanding and improve their overall research experience. And finally, I'll make some suggestions for next steps that might be taken to design not only better reading rooms, but other archival services as well. My review of the literature reveals several areas of interest by scholars, and all of these areas have findings of consequence to archives, I believe. The research questions that cognitive scientists and reading specialists have dealt with include attitudes about screen reading versus paper reading, memory and comprehension, mental resources and cognitive processes, deep thinking and analysis, attention levels and distraction multitasking, and perception, interpretation, and understanding. For my purposes this afternoon, I'm most interested in deep thinking, attention, and distractions as they apply to our work. The reading and literacy scholar Anne Mangan of Norway reports that scrolling and other activities characteristic of screen reading, such as skimming and scanning the text, have an impact on cognitive performance. Even though the screen platform seems to encourage reading habits that allow distractions to creep in, Mengen observes that distractions may be reduced through metacognitive practices such as self-induced time constraints. Naomi Barron, a professor of linguistics at American University, delineates the affordances of the reading on screens and reading on print. Screen reading provides great advantages for searching and for taking in much information, while print encourages deep reading of texts. She calls for a greater mindfulness where one's attention is at, is at at any given time in either platform. And her suggestion supports David Levy's research in this regard. Levy is a computer scientist and professor at the University of Washington School of Information. And his work, which is at the intersection of technology and contemplation, provides some key concepts for our purposes. He brings contemplative practices to bear on the multiple distractions that tug at our ability to focus, and he offers meditation as a strategy, one strategy, to clear one's mind in preparation for what comes next. These researchers have indicated that the characteristics of screen brain, uh, to include scanning, skipping, skimming, and jumping around in a non-linear way, can linger even when you transition to reading on paper. Maybe casual reading is your goal anyway, and the transition to a less restive, restless reading state isn't so critical. But maybe you may need to take that deep dive into a text. How then quickly can you make that shift to paper brain mode of reading 
which requires more time and cognitive effort. Marianne Wolf, a cognitive scientist based at Tufts University, introduces the idea of cognitive patience in descriptions of deep reading. And she claims that this shift doesn't happen, happen quickly enough for her. So she tries, and she suggests, to put some time between screen activities and any reading that she needs uh, and wants to do. But what if time is limited? And one really needs to make that transition swiftly. I think that contemplative elements may help us here. I'm sure we'd all agree that uh, we believe the reading room is a place for concentration and focus. In thinking about the design of reading rooms, I'm proposing a different framework for thinking about these spaces in support of the work that gets done in them. I'm calling for us to acknowledge that distractions and interruptions right, are the antithesis of concentration and focus, and the obstacles to the purposes for which our users have come. I'm concerned with a reading room operation and design that holds our users' thinking processes and understanding to be at the core of our concerns and efforts. This view of the reading room pulls from Michelle Caswell's and Marika Sephora's work on radical empathy and ethics of care. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a minute. In addition to the challenges that different reading platforms present to focus and concentration, I see others as well. Uh, they're external, internal, and then intrinsic to the, re to the materials that um, we provide in the reading room. For the external distractions, I'm really thinking here about the physical items such as laptops and tablets and cell phones that users often take with them into the reading room. Most users who bring these devices will use them for note taking and perhaps to check citations or search for something that is related and pertinent to their current study. Although these devices may place a greater demand on attention, they also present present support for the research at hand. And our readers make choices about where they place their attention, and in doing so, they need to be self-aware enough to know when attention is wandering and needs to be brought back to center to accomplish their research goals. Other external distractions can be invisible stresses and worries that our users bring with them. These distractions can undermine concentration in the reading room. Are they on a deadline for an article or a book? Is the semester ending soon and the last paper isn't quite coming together? Did the user just receive uh, troubling news, unwelcome news, sad news, just before they arrived at the archives? These invisible distractions might have an impact on their ability to concentrate and uh, focus when they uh, get to their work at hand in the reading room. I think we also have internal distractions, internal to the reading room space. The spaces can create physical and emotional distractions. The reading room can be too cold or too warm. Chairs can be uncomfortable over long periods of time. The lighting too bright or too low. We can often make adjustments in the moment to help our users in this regard, but while thinking about the physical environment of the room, we need to pay attention to other elements that can have, that, are, that can create an emotional impact for our users. Historian Ashley Farmer of the University of Texas at Austin wrote an essay last year about working in archives and archival reading rooms as a black woman. She wrote, in more than one instance, I have looked up from my research to see paintings of white men famous for committing heinous acts against indigenous communities or racist artifacts displayed proudly as if devoid of the context in which they were produced. End quote. With an ethics of care framework, archivists care about the psychological weight, distraction such as these, such as these. Um, and should work to address them and eliminate them in our reading rooms. The third distraction I'd like to address is the in intrinsic distraction found in the material itself. Whether our users are reading on paper or on screen, some material may contain content that is violent, traumatic, and emotionally upsetting. And these situations definitely present significant challenges 
to our, mu to our users in maintaining concentration and the challenge to regain it once lost. We can't know how a user will react to or respond to the material we provide. Therefore, our response to that should be to care enough to offer encouragement towards self-awareness about where one stands emotionally and mentally at any given moment. We can offer suggestions through the contemplative design and elements of the reading room to do just that. We should be there to help the contemplative aspect of research along and make our users' research experience worth the emotional expenditure it often requires. And we do this through the care we take with our reading rooms and the caregivingness we offer to those who work within them. My thoughts about the caregivingness of archival staff in supporting the reading room has its roots in the literature of radical empathy and feminist ethics of care, and particularly from the work of Michelle Caswell and Marika Sephora, who place these concepts in an archival context and who urge archivists to develop a connection with others and be concerned with the thoughts and feelings of our users. To practice radical empathy, to me, is to inhabit a state of concern and attentiveness to the mental and emotional space and physical well-being of our users. Caregiving is a manifestation of this state. And one of the manifestations of this care is to shift toward helping our users contemplate, that is, to think deeply and to work toward a deep understanding. In an ethics of care framework, Caswell and Sephora writes about, write about effective relationships, and one of which is to place the user at the center. They write that, quote, we need to build policies, procedures, services with these users in mind, but even more so, we need to shift our effective orientation and service to these users. What happens when we shift our orientation to users? One outcome of the shift is for us to be interested in a prepared state of mind as our users enter our reading rooms and to maintain and to have them maintain a focused mind while there. It would require us to care about whether our users are in an optimum place, emotionally, mentally, and physically, for what they need to do in our reading room space. David Levy, the school, a University of Washington School of Information professor, says that we, quote, operate less effectively and less healthfully when we are distracted physically, when we are distracted, physically uncomfortable, and emotionally upset, end quote. If we are adopting a radical empathy and ethics of care perspective, then we must be concerned with these factors. What then is a radical act on behalf of researchers in the reading room? To me, a radical act is an adoption of a contemplative ethos and a commitment to adding elements and making those spaces contemplative in nature. The radical shift I want to make is to have our archivists be concerned with contemplation and understanding and to be observant and proactive in reducing, and in some cases, eliminating elements in the research process that introduce disruptions and drains on con and, uh, concentration and focus. When thinking about contemplation, when thinking about a contemplative ethos for the reading room, once again I quote from David Levy, who writes that concentration and focus is a matter of having an awareness of oneself and being in the moment. He says, quote, the act of concentrating can bring us into greater balance, inviting greater calmness and clarity. He doesn't claim that it is easy, however, he does support contemplative approaches to aid in this. A US-based nonprofit group called the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society has developed an organizational framework for thinking about contemplative practices that I found to be useful in thinking about reading room design and that keeps our users centered and supports deep thinking and understanding. The Center's tree of contemplative practices incorporates seven main branches with multiple offshoots from each branch. Some of these practices translate to the reading room better than others, however, all offer something for us to consider. The society places awareness as one of the roots of the contemplative practices tree, and it is a place of beginnings. I'll move quickly uh, through these, lingering on some, however. We begin on um, 
the right side of the tree, we encounter ritual. It's an element, an element of the ritual branch of the tree is establishing a personal space. And I'm sure that we've seen uh, plenty of researchers come in, their regulars come in, and they'll go to a favorite space and they'll create um, their workspace, set their boxes up just so. And you should encourage this behavior, I think. Moving up the tree's main trunk, we encounter movement. In practicing caregiving this, we can remind users to make periodic breaks to go outside or to take a break within the room itself. Our users could do stretches at their seats, or if there's room, we could set aside space at the back for movement breaks. We might place rockers in the room. These can provide much needed sensory input and soothing. These movements, stretches, yoga poses, walking, rocking, all offer the body a break from intense work and helps to refocus energy onto the job at hand. Continuing to move up the tree, we encounter relational and deep listening as one of these elements. It strikes me that in order to achieve deep reading and deep thinking and deep listening, our users need to be able to move past disruptions and distractions with some agility. They need to be aware enough to recognize when their minds have wandered and the deepness required of their task has shallowed out. This is essential in order to really hear what the voices from the material may be saying to our users. I want to move uh, past activist and creative to get to generative and stillness, which are at the bottom on the left side of the tree. Here we find deep contemplative reading and visualization. With a radical empathy framework, we can encourage folks in the reading room to exercise metacognition, to think about their thinking or visual, visualize what they want to get done and how they want to go about it for the time they have in the reading room. And I believe that the stillness branch is a really fruitful area of the tree because it requires that we think about the mind and the body. Meditation can help keep focus on research and keep distractions at bay. Centering uh, refers to the relaxed, yet focused state of mind, and concentrating on quieting the mind can help prepare the mind for the work at hand in the reading room. So what would my next steps be um, in, this, in this research? I have plans to partner with a faculty member from the University of Virginia's Contemplative Sciences Center, who is an expert in and interested in contemplative reading. She and I have had initial discussions about our reading room, and she's interested in working with me to look at um, distractions in a reading room setting. I also intend to create a list of contemplative practices that we can encourage for the reading room. These might include mindfulness, deep breathing, meditation, stretches, certain yoga poses, and um, in doing this, would create ways to communicate these in the reading room, either through table signs or posters or uh, things of that sort. I want to create what I'm calling a contemplative check-in and make that part of our registration procedure. I see this as a checklist that we can hand to our users that they can go through on their own. It might ask them to um, assess their level of stress or their anxiousness or whether they have any um, heavy thoughts that they're bringing into their experiencing at the moment. And the purpose of the check-in would be to help the user gain uh, an awareness of their brain preparedness uh, for their research. And then, uh, and then our contemplative exercises and activities in the reading room can help them push those away. I'd like to see us embrace Marianne Wolf's idea of a biliterate brain and approach screen reading and paper reading as two distinct methods of reading, each with strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and challenges inherent in each, and begin to design instruction and other services that play off of those strengths. I'd like to create a presentation that can be used in instruction sessions that introduce students to the value of contemplative methods and support and focus and concentration. To wrap up, I see opportunities for collaboration in, in areas that are understudied, the space where brain science intersects with archives. And I'm eager to embrace radical empathy and caregiving in the reading room. 
setting by centering our users' focus and concentration. And I urge us to be keeping in mind the various distractions and disruptions that undermine our users' work, those that our researchers bring with them, but most especially those that are built into our systems, policies, procedures, and environments. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diane. And just before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're living on, the Korean people. Um, and so, yeah, so we're essentially going to be um, talking about, so I'll be presenting this with my two colleagues. Um, and the presentation is about um, the work that we've been doing around our systems and data. So tying it back to the theme of the conference, what we're essentially looking at is what does it mean to uh, design and develop a user-centric um, archive from a data and systems perspective. Uh, and so we'll be going into some of the um, work that we've been doing um, to ensure our data and systems uh, meet the needs of all of our users and hopefully um, trigger some discussion around that. So, uh, yeah, so about us, so, um, that we'll, um, as Diana said, um, I'll be presenting with Julie and Kate, my colleagues, um, and so we'll start with a little bit of background about Public Record Office Victoria. Sorry? All right. So um, we'll be talking about um, a little bit of background about Public Record Office Victoria. Then we'll, um, Julie will go into the data modeling work that we've been doing. Um, I'll come back and talk about the systems and the technology. Uh, and then Kate will take a, a um, user um, perspective a little bit of access um, to the records. So, for those that don't know PROV, uh, we're the Victorian State Government Archive. Uh, we were established in 1973 and we've got records that date back to the 1930s. Uh, and the first digital archive was implemented in 2003, so we've been doing digital stuff for quite some time. Um, our, and we received some funding um, in 2015 to uh, replace our key systems. Um, the systems that we're in the process of replacing at the moment uh, are quite old now. Um, they've, they're commercial systems that were very heavily customized. Uh, and that means that they've been very difficult to maintain and update. Uh, and they, they're inflexible and don't provide us with opportunities to uh, provide flexible ways of accessing the collection. So, um, yeah, and the other thing is the infrastructure and, and the software systems are very tight and integrated, so it makes um, maintenance also very difficult. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Julie now. So as Owen said, we hold the records of the state of Victoria, that's state and local government agencies, courts, hospitals and schools, so we have quite a broad remit. Our holdings date back from dates in 1836, with the first colonial settlement of the Port Phillip district under the administration of the colony of New South Wales. We hold 95 kilometres of hard copy records, so I have to tip that down a bit. And uh, we have around just over 600,000 born digital records in our collection. Um, that's not that's records that started digital and were transferred to us as digital objects. We transfer around two kilometres of hard copy records every year. So to manage all these records and their context, we have around four and a half thousand agencies registered, 18 and a half thousand record series. We've documented around 400 functions and we have 7.5 million physical items described to some level of description. So I'm going to start with the conceptual background. 
So today we're going to take you through the program of work um, that we've conducted over the past three, four years to upgrade PROG's capacity to accept, preserve and make accessible contemporary digital records of Victorian government. And I'm here just representing a whole collective of people who've been working on this project over the last three to four years. So I wanted to acknowledge in particular uh, Barbara Reed, who advised us on our archival control model, and Emma Fowler and Dave Fowler, who've done a mountain, a mountain of work developing our new metadata schema. So onto the program. So before we commenced in earnest, and using the philosophy of how can we do things better, we did two critical reviews. First up, we looked at our archival data model. That is our conceptual approach to managing, describing, and preserving government records. This was the first major rethink in a generation. We wanted to ensure that the, the, the theoretical model that we had in place was clear, consistent, and in step with current thinking and any new system that we developed was not compromised in any way by a need to support inconsistent descriptive practice that may have crept in over the years. And secondly, we also reviewed our digital preservation requirements, um, which specify a new more, a much more flexible requirements that are concerned with the construct of digital objects from any system, such as line of business systems directly from the system in which they were created and managed, moving away from specifying more detailed system requirements as mandatory preconditions for the creation of digital objects. So it's been really important for us to expand our digital preservation methodology. We acknowledge that most agencies conduct their primary business in a line of business system, and rather than an EDRMS, so records that are more likely than not to be of continuing value to the state of Victoria. So it was really critical for us that we expand our capability to preserve them. It was also important for us that we could continue this flexibility in our archival documentation. So these reviews provided us with a fresh start it enabled, us our, it enabled our new conceptual approach to be supported by technology rather than the other way around. That is, our record keeping requirements would be in fact be central to the design of our new systems. So today I'm going to be talking about our archival control review. So first up, I'll briefly give you an overview of the previous model. It was based on the Commonwealth Record Series system developed by the National Archives of Australia and it was implemented at PROF from the early 1980s and evolved over time. We had quite a few problems with this model. It's hierarchical in nature, uh, reflecting the traditional file record structure of 19th and 20th century record keeping. It was really difficult to describe records that may exist and have meaning in multiple contexts. It did not readily support the capture of metadata schema from agency information systems, nor additional metadata such as geographic location, for example, which would permit Victorian records to be described in a national or international context. It didn't easily support data sharing or reuse without much transformation work. And in practice, there had been a blurring of intellectual and physical control and physical control concepts such as consignments and units had become embedded in archival description practice. So this is our new model, which looks very simple, but it's um, conceptual and agnostic to the technology that may be used to implement it. It's simple in design, flexible, not hierarchical, with much more focus on relationships between and within entities rather than hierarchy, whilst remaining grounded in Australian archival practice. It reconceptualises the concept of a record, aligns with standards, and has a structured metadata scheme that enables PROF to share data. It represents records consistently, irrespective of whether they are digital or physical, and as it's backwards compatible with our existing documentation, it's been designed for gradual update. It's conformant with ASNZS5478 Australian Record Keeping Metadata Property Set, that is the underlying concepts, principles, terminology, 
and meaning is aligned with the standard and adapt, which is being adapted for the Grog Greenwich. So being standards based, Grogs will be able to share and exchange metadata with other organisations relatively easily. So we've implemented three entities, record, function and agent, with multiple subtypes within each entity and we have a much greater emphasis on the documentation of relationships between and within entities. We've removed record group, consignment, unit and sub-item and consignments are no longer part of the intellectual model but will continue to exist for management purposes only. A major shift forward is that the new model allows records descriptions for physical and digital records completely within the same archival documentation system, unlike previously where the digital record metadata was maintained separately from our archival management system, Archives One. And the model also permits the documentation of relationships outside the archival control model, user-generated content such as transcriptions, commentary and access copies of records. And Owen's going to talk about that a bit further on. And importantly for us, the beauty of the new model is that further entity types may be added over time without having to rethink the entire model. So here's some further detail about the new entities and their subtypes. Currently we've defined two types of the record entity, that is type series and type item. A key shift with this model is that it describes records as conceptual entities but does not explicitly define or manage the instantiations of those records. So typically records of type item will have at least one instantiation, the preservation copy, which can be physical or digital, and may also have zero or more secondary copies, such as a digitised version or an access copy, for example. Additional relationships between and within entities can be documented. It will allow, allow us to describe digital records in multiple contexts. So for example, a digital record may belong to more than one series. So we can capture the multiple views of records, noting the way that you reach a record can help you interpret the meaning of the record. The agent entity, for us primarily that's agency in the administrative unit of government, but the revised model allows for additional types of the agent entity to be registered and documented. So these include for us person or mechanisms machines. So we can register persons who have rights over the records, they might be considered as agents, we can document that rights relationship to the records within the model. And persons may be also be used as creating or recording agents to document the provenance more precisely. So under function entity, which is the defined as the major responsibilities of government, it may be linked via relationships to agent and records. And in addition, we'll have um, a type term to allow for existing terms to be migrated and help us to provide a thesaurus of approved promotion titles. So here's a snapshot of all the relationships for each of the entities. Um, you can go ahead and read that slide. I'm not going to read all that out. Some of that will be very familiar and some of them are a little bit new for us. So I'm just going to move on to a demonstration of the entity relationships. So I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of the model and, and the relationships commencing with the function known as Botanic Gardens, which is very attractive to me, which commenced in 1851. So the model allows us to document the relationships with other functions, in this case functions known as Crown Lands Public, Crown Lands Government, Survey and Observatory. We can then move to the agencies which have had some administrative responsibility for the botanic gardens over time, describing both the time frame and the nature of the relationship, commencing with the Colonial Secretary's Office, then the Chief Secretary's Department, Public Works Department, Crown Lands and Survey and so on. <coughs> so 
from here, the record entity relationships, the record series with their controlling and temporal relationships through the original record keeping systems, the register, the index, the files and documents, containment relationships within the record entity with the record items, whether they be files or documents, physical or digital, any level of description is possible and relationships between record series and record items where the original record keeping systems have been disturbed or lost. And importantly, we'll be able to capture descriptions of records or relationships between records at any level of aggregation and make that available. Especially helpful for us where the systems have been disturbed as I mentioned before. So to draw it all together, lots of, there's the um, containment relationships. Drawing it all together, relationships between records and functions will be directly documented for the first time. So to demonstrate that the model also works for our digital records, here I've got a diagram of a digital preservation package containing five record items, all of which will be described in the archival documentation and related to other records and their context. So, um, detailed metadata schema has been developed for each of the archival model entities, the relationships between the entities and the archival management data, around 240 properties across agent, function and record. The key principles which directed their development was that we wanted to maintain consistency with the Australian theory system, we wanted to achieve broad consistency with the requirements of the 5478 set, we wanted to provide support for key, key prof business practices and we wanted to remain compatible with the previous ACM. So our metadata comprises a mix of metadata mandated by formal schemes and our, with our own additional focus on description, disposal and format. Up to 80 properties are, avail are available to describe and manage an item and everybody will be relieved to hear only a small number of those are mandatory. Uh, records description, title, date, preservation status, form and persistent identifier. And the digital records can have AGLS or ASZS5478 metadata plus any additional agency metadata pack packages can also be captured. So at the beginning I mentioned our revised um, digital preservation requirements very, very briefly, which allow us to capture metadata schemes in digital preservation packages. The new ACM and its metadata properties enables us to capture the semantic meaning of this metadata. It will allow us to provide enhanced description capability, attribute meaning, assign labels to data, and allow for more flexibility in the description of hard copy records. It will be possible to capture the meaning of the original record keeping, da record keeping to data, e.g. the meaning of dates, whether it's admission date, date of receipt, meeting date, um, any level of description will now be possible. So here is a photograph album, which is a classic example illustrated here. Um, it's going to be allow us to describe the entire album or a sleeve or the individual photographs in the um, sleeves. So it's also going to allow us to describe and capture alternative agency names in a much more elegant fashion than we've been able to previously. A key task for all this has been mapping our existing data into the new properties to transform it into the new structure. However, we acknowledge there are many gaps in the documentation and the new level of description just won't be in place overnight. And Kate's going to take you through some of the issues with the current data and how it impacts researchers. However, we're optimistic that our new approach sets us up well for the future. Ongoing practice and experience will build up a body of descriptive precedent to support implementation of the model over time. New records transfers will be the first to be described under the new approach and the documentation of our existing holdings, although restructured, will be upgraded and enhanced over the years through digitisation, volunteer and dedicated documentation projects. 
So I'm now going to hand over to Owen, who will talk about the technology upgrade required to implement the new archival practice. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk about um, some of the work that we've been doing around our systems now. Uh, we originally, the, so the post in, in the title is actually the name of the program of work that we have for replacing our key systems. Um, just briefly, uh, it's commenced in 2015. The scope's actually changed quite a bit since then in some ways. So. Um, where, where it's become more ambitious as we've gone along, which I think is a really good thing. Um, and just briefly, um, you know, again, tying it back to the, the conference theme, um, these are two key objectives that we've been looking at achieving. One is around um, tying our uh, additional contextual information that we have about the records uh, back to the collection. And, um, and finding ways of structuring um, the descriptive information um, in flexible ways. So, uh, just very briefly, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but this is the, the key systems that we're implementing, and feel free to come and have a chat about them um, later if you want to grab me. Uh, the important thing to note here is that we're looking at, we're implementing a modular approach to these systems. So we're taking primarily off the shelf, um, mostly open source components and we're integrating them together. Um, and I'll just talk quickly about some of the key data sources. So the archival management system, which holds the um, the information that Julie was talking about, um, so our archival documentation, we're implementing connective access for that. We have a separate warehouse management system, and that is responsible for managing the location of the records, both in the archive and beyond. Uh, we've got a system called Request and Pay, uh, which handles ordering and payment and all that sort of stuff. And our secondary asset management system, which I will talk about in a little bit more detail, um, and that's based on some software, some repository software called Fedora Commons. So, just quickly back to the new model. Um, so, I'm a technologist, I'm not an archivist. So, when I see this model, which incidentally is quite um, heavily um, influenced by the work of Rick. Um, I, I see it as a, as a graph, um, and so it's got a lot of parallels to semantic web sort of thinking. Um, essentially, you've got entities and relationships between entities, and um, there's rules around how those relationships um, map. So, um, thinking about it then from a semantic web point of view, um, as I say, we're talking about entities and relationships, and another really critical part of, of the picture is that we need to have consistency and um, persistence for um, mapping those relationships. So another key system um, that we've implemented as part of these new systems is uh, a system to allocate persistent identifiers um, using the handle system. So, uh, just briefly, some of the key technologies we've been using is handles for uh, persistently identifying the um, entities in the collection. Uh, we're using RDF um, to structure contextual information about the records um, in our secondary asset management system. And we're using another um, the International Image Interoperability Framework, uh, which is a way of flexibly um, dealing with large amounts of digitized content. So our secondary asset management system, um, I, I think it's important to just delve into that in a tiny bit more detail. Um, what we can do, what we are doing in, in this system, 
is actually um, describing components of, of the records um, and um, and at a sort of finer level of granularity than is the case in our archival management system. So it enables us to um, define different types of additional contextual information uh, and that could be extended descriptions, transcription information, um, digitized copies, all that sort of stuff. So um, as you can see on the diagram, um, a, a record is usually broken down into um, different components and they're generally pages and then we attach um, through relationships, um, through RDF, different um, to different things to that to those pages, those conceptual pages. And what this means then, when we um, bring it back to um, the user through our interface, is um, we show um, we can show the archival um, information alongside the information that we're storing about the record, that additional contextual information. Um, so, yeah, so that's a little bit of background about the systems. Um, and I guess just quickly, I wanted to touch on a couple of the challenges that we're facing, um, which I think I've heard a few times um, in the last, yeah, in the last few sessions I've been to as well. Um, we're, we're, we are a state archive, but we're still quite a small organisation. Uh, and so we've got large responsibilities with limited budget. Uh, so implementing um, these systems, you know, there are challenges involved with that. Uh, also implementing semantic web technologies ge generically uh, in an archival context takes a bit of thinking and expertise which we're developing. Um, we've also got relatively limited um, technology um, uh, expertise in the, in the underlying technologies and standards which need further development as well. Uh, and, and one of the issues I think that's common to a lot of archives is although we've got a, a small um, amount of, of um, digital content relative to um, you know, some really large uh, repositories, it's actually super high value, so um, and preserving is obviously key. So um, that's just a sort of snapshot of, of the systems work that we're doing um, to support the um, the data modeling work that's happening in Prof as well. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Kate for a user perspective. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Kate Folland and I work as one of the managers of um, communications and online engagement at Public Record Office Victoria. And I'm speaking very quickly here to give you an example of being a stakeholder in the room when they were consulting um, people around PROV on these new systems. And some of the conversations we had in realising that some of the ideas of the archival control model, although are wonderful in planning for the future and allowing for flexible formats and um, flexible access, um, there were a couple, uh, there was one in, uh, one issue in particular that um, sent uh, sent some staff into almost a nervous breakdown, and um, that was I'll go into it in just a second. So. Um, in some cases, applying a new system in a practical sense when the vast majority of our records are historic records um, doesn't always work from a practical perspective. So we have a reading room that's open five days a week. Um, last year we serviced 11,000 researchers and they ordered up 55,000 records into the reading room. That's a lot of records to pick on a daily basis for a very small team. Um, and the, one of the elements of the new archival control model is to remove unit. And unit has pr predominantly been a descriptor for the container with which holds the record, whether that be a box or a cylinder or, or a plastic slip for, for a map. 
and is, is uh, not necessarily relevant um, for an archival control model, but is quite relevant when you're doing historical research. So I'll explain why. So here's an example of a typical historical research question. In the 1940s, um, Melbourne decided to do a massive slum clearance scheme, and what that meant was to clear um, thousands and thousands and thousands of homes around the inner city of Melbourne. And um, in, in one case, they moved around a thousand families into a park, a major park in the middle of Melbourne called Royal Park, and then moved them into an old army base called Camp Pell. And when I heard this story, I was quite curious as to know why would the government leave families in um, an old army camp in Royal Park for not one year, but 10 years they were left to live there. It was described in the newspapers at the time as one of the largest slums created, um, and it was created by the government to solve the slum problem. So there was some irony there. And I thought, well, goodness, we would definitely have you know, records discussing this particular problem. Here's another photograph of um, Camp Pell, as it was referred to in history books. So this is a common historic query. Why would the government place families into Camp Pell for 10 years? So I decided to go and do a keyword search. And this is the type of research that the typical archival researcher faces when they're doing deep dive research. That's where their keywords don't match our catalogue, and it's very common. You're going to be researching for a long time. Chances are the keywords inside your head don't match the record metadata within our catalogue, and you've got a lot of records to go through. This journey is very typical, and, and many historic researchers and people researching archives, it can be weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years of research. When you're doing research, where the metadata in your head doesn't match the catalogue. And so, what we do is we enable researchers to order up to eight records at any one time, or eight items up to any one time. Now that could be eight boxes, such as a unit, or eight records, individually. Now it's obviously, if you can order up eight boxes and be able to quickly um, work your way through up to 20 records within a box in one afternoon by ordering up to eight boxes, your research is going to be expedited, it's going to be much faster. And so when we heard through rumours that the unit was going to be removed from the archival control model and potentially removed from um, the catalogue, this was our reaction. As was the reaction, I'd say, of any researchers that got hold of this information. And as a stakeholder group, it was important to feed back to the design team that um, is there any way that we can have UNIT go back into the ordering system? Because for our pickers, so the ASO teams that go into the collection every morning and respond to upwards of 300 orders a day, to have to sort through boxes and pull out records is simply impractical. When you've only got three or four staff working on a, a pick of around 150 orders, being able to pick a box or would, is, a, is a much more efficient process. So, I decided to start researching the Housing Commission of Victoria Records because they're the people that put these families into Camp Hill in the first place. And of course, I find the correspondence records and I think, great, correspondence records, if you don't know what they are, they're kind of like the social media of the past. So the correspondence, the letters going back and forth, either between departments or through to the public, they are the meat, they're the, they're the wonderful records that often you need to go and read and browse in order to understand what was going on in the minds of that government agency at that time. And they're often, that detail is in the physical paper record. You're not going to find it in the catalogue. And so I sought the answer to my question through the correspondence files. Sure enough, Secretaries, Housing Commission Victoria, correspondence files, 1940 to 1973. So somewhere in that box is the answer to my query. And this is what it would look like if we didn't have UNIT. I would be looking at a subject list of records from the Housing Commission of Victoria, starting with the letter A and going through to the letter Z, and I could potentially be, if that is that, if the first one is a record, I would only be able to order up eight records at a time, and I'd still be at the letter A. So I looked at the subject listing, hoping that that would help. Okay, I'll have a look at the subject listing. Sure enough, number C, Camp Hill, still not there. But what is there was Royal Park. Uh, army, army camp, 
Carlton and Fitzroy. And I thought somewhere in those there may, might be a mention of Camp Hell, so I've started to nail it down. So I guess what I'm demonstrating is that what could be an afternoon's worth of research by pulling up the boxes with those letters in them could turn into potentially weeks of research if we remove unit from the ordering process and return back to only being able to order records. So what we have done as a solution is we have returned the ability to order a unit and we've called it a box. So the average person knows that they are ordering a box. And next to each of those record listings will be the word view items of this box. And as you click it, up will come the, all of the items within that box so that the researcher knows that that's what they're ordering and they can order up the whole box if they wish. And that returns not through the archival control model, not through the original uh, catalog, but through the ordering system, we have placed back the ability to order the full box and the unit, independent of the archival control model. Also, one of the other solutions we decided is that the problem with series, series titles is sometimes there's no historic context, and context is really important when you're making a decision. And so with flexible metadata schema, which is the one that's going to be introduced, we will be able to place the agency details, such as Housing Commission Victoria, back into the interface screen directly related to the series. And so that will help people when there's vague descriptions of items and vague descriptions of series, such as just simply the words correspondence, who created the correspondence file. Um, so yeah, so that, that was basically just a simple example. Um, some of the other ideas we've had is introducing icons next to some of the um, entity descriptors, such as agency, record series, and using icons as a way to explain to the user what they are. Um, that's an example of the visual display of the box, so being, people being able to see that, and then using the icons in the search results screen as well. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Owen now to wrap up. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense of um, some of the work that we've been doing around data and systems. Um, and basically, our, uh, the way I see our challenge is to design our data models and systems um, so that the archive can be accessed in flexible ways um, for all users um, and, and we don't have to predetermine how that's going to happen. So that's, what, that's our sort of overarching idea. So thank you. Uh, Marisa Young, I have a question for Brenda. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Brenda, thank you so much for your paper. Um, you talked about chairs in the reading room, aiding deep thinking. I just wondered, have you also given some consideration to the design of tables or desks, um, particularly given the fact that uh, cognitive psychologists in education are really beginning to hone into uh, the relationships between deep thinking, memory, and the shift from handwriting through to a preference now for keyboard skills, or in some cases, simply photographing it with a mobile phone, and the sort of impact that's beginning to have on secondary students and university students. Thank you. Okay. Um, we haven't gotten to the point where we're looking at uh, physical items, you know, tables and chairs. Um, but one of the things that I want to do with um, the professor that I'm going to be working with is, is looking at all of those things. And um, what you're bringing up about handwriting, uh, some of the literature that I, um, I've seen hasn't really looked at uh, the implications for handwriting. Um, so it's been screen reading and reading print, but I haven't found anything that, that looks at um, non-print material, manuscript material. So that might be a, I think that's a fruitful area for additional research to see if those differences between, um, you know, skimming and skipping on screens versus the linear 
sort of reading that happens with print, but that holds up with handwriting as well. Any other questions? Um, Kate Roberts from the National Archives of Australia. I just had a question. You talked a lot about the emotional impact on researchers sometimes in reading records. Um, in your experience, have you given much thought to the warnings or information that you might provide to researchers before they actually open a record so they can make a sort of informed decision? Yeah, so that was a good session earlier, uh, earlier today. Were you in that session? No, okay, so there was a lot of talk, and um, I can't remember the, the, uh, which one it was, but anyway, we got into, it was on description. Um, and at the University of Virginia, we haven't uh, started using warnings, except for one collection that we put together since the August 2017 um, um, events that happen on grounds at the University of Virginia for them um, and, and what happened in town with the, the um, white supremacist who came in and talked about. So, in the aftermath of that event, we gathered documentation and we're still gathering documentation to build the collection that documents those, those days. And we're really thinking about what kind of warning that we would have um, for the online resource. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of disturbing images, photographs that have been uh, given to us, um, signage that we've gotten either in physical form or um, digital copies. So we're thinking about we're thinking about that for sure. There's also um, a commission at the University of Virginia. It's a, it's a president level commission that's looking at the university and its relationship with enslaved labor. And so the uh, members of the commission are doing a lot of work and thinking about um, and we in the archives are following along with, with their thinking about warnings and, and um, alerting people to disturbing images and things like that. So we do have a lot of, especially visual images in the archives related to lynchings and um, the very disturbing things like that. So we are going to do it when we have it done, I guess. Um, we've come to the end of our time, um, so I think we better wrap up. But I'd like to thank Nicole, Brenda, Hector, and Mark for their presentations. And I'm sure if you did have more questions, they'd be happy to catch up with you um, later. So if you could join with me in thanking them once again.